From KCBS Radio, I'm Matt Pittman, and this is Bay Current for Tuesday, February 8th. Today we continue our series of conversations focused on the month-long celebration of Black History Month. But today we're tackling some subjects that provide some very troubling statistics. But I think they also provide an opportunity to have some pretty crucial conversations. Today, the inequities in healthcare that are killing black Americans more than any other group in the United States. And we are not immune here in the Bay Area. Since the start of the pandemic, we've come to learn a lot about the disproportionate and adverse impacts of COVID on people of color and minority communities. And nationwide, the COVID death rate among black and African Americans is higher than twice that of white non-Hispanic Americans, according to the Kaiser Family Foundation. Another pandemic continues to disproportionately impact the black community acutely, HIV AIDS. And the statistics are staggering. I actually found some of them hard to read because they paint such a disturbing picture. Here's a little more from the Kaiser Family Foundation. As recent as 2017, blacks accounted for more than four in 10, 44% of deaths among people with an HIV diagnosis. And HIV is the sixth leading cause of death for black men ages 25 to 34. Eighth for black women ages 35 to 44. And black women account for the largest share of new HIV diagnoses, 59%, 14 times the rate of white women. Yesterday, February 7th, was National Black HIV and AIDS Awareness Day. A community panel discussion was held remotely over Zoom with Dr. Hyman Scott of the San Francisco Department of Public Health and UCSF as one of the leading voices in the discussion, focused on awareness, education, and community support. And Dr. Scott is my guest today. Tell me a little bit about what this day is is like every year in terms of putting on events like this and having community conversations. And what are the messages that you want to get out and what do you look to hear from people? Well, thank you for inviting me and having me on the podcast. You and, you know, I think that um, <clears throat> what it's like most years is not what it's like this year with COVID, uh, as this was a virtual event in, in years past. And, um, you know, this has been the 20th year since um, this event has been and been put on in observance of um, National HIV um, Awareness Day in the Black community. And... Um, it is uh, a great conversation uh, with a community um, representation from different parts of our community talking about um, the state of HIV in the Black community and what does the data tell us about what's happening in our communities? What does the data uh, give us that might shed insights into places and uh, strategies that might um, be uh, able to change the the disparities. I think that we have seen this, um, you know, very um, impressive decline overall in HIV diagnoses uh, in San Francisco, um, <clears throat> and that we've seen that the disparities have persisted, um, and that in some in some ways they've expanded. Um, and so those are the types of things that we focus on to create community and also to uh, think about from a community uh, oriented perspective, like how do we respond uh, to the HIV uh, epidemic that is uh, within our communities? So you mentioned what the data tells you about the picture here in San Francisco. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah. So um, in San Francisco, we have um, in 2020, which is impacted by COVID and lack of testing that um, that happened in response to um, to changes in access to many of our clinical settings. But we had 131 HIV diagnoses in um, in San Francisco in 2020. And when we look at the uh, the rate of diagnoses by our different populations. Uh, which adjusts for the size of the community. Um, black men have the the highest rate of HIV in San Francisco, um, followed by Latino men, um, followed by black women. Um, so black women have a higher rates um, of HIV in San Francisco uh, than all other men except for black and Latino men. 
And so that is sort of the um, the, the state of HIV um, in San Francisco. So we've seen this decline that has been, um, you know, the goal of the of San Francisco is really to, to get to zero HIV infections and zero HIV deaths. Um, and we've seen uh, declines among uh, many of our populations, but these disparities persist despite that happening. Um, and we haven't really seen a, um, a change in mortality. So the number of um, deaths um, among people living with HIV has been stable. And when we look at it again by this rate uh, adjusting for the size of the population, um, Black men have the highest rate among any population um, of dying from HIV mm -hmm. um, in San Francisco. And so it's still persistent. It's still um, present. And I, I think that the data really speak to a lot of the things that, um, you know, that are driving this. So we talked a little bit about, you know, the biggest predictor of health is zip code. It's like yeah. where you live. Yeah. And there's this often desire to uh, relate uh, negative health, particularly negative health outcomes to individual behavior. And it's, um, you know, these disparities are, are not driven by, you know, uh, at a population level, just individual behavior. There are systemic and social and structural reasons why these disparities exist and persist. Yeah. And that the reason, you know, a big reason why we haven't seen this decline in the way that we had hoped and are hoping is because we haven't been able to really impact those um those social and structural determinants that are really underpinning this. So as much as we can, sort of separating out the socioeconomic factors, what are some of the other major barriers to getting equitable care? So I think that, you know, that there are definitely social economic and that the, that interplays with a lot of other aspects. So, you know, what, um, what healthcare systems you have access to, what types of, um, providers you have access to, what is your ability to go in and have a supportive conversation about, um, your health and, um, what is your access to, to high quality foods? What is your access to, um, outdoor space that is safe and um, and clean? And what is your access to water? What is your access to all these other things that are, you know, in, very tightly tied to to what your social economic status is and where you live? If you have, um, you know, areas where there is, um, you know, gun violence or other types of violence, you might not be comfortable going outside. If you are um, being pulled over by the police all the time, you it's not safe for you to be out. So there, there are lots of other things that are um, that are all interconnected, and there are social um, aspects of it as well. You know, thinking about what is the trust or mistrust that exists mm -hmm. within healthcare settings, um, and is there a reason for you know communities to trust the healthcare system? I think we've seen a lot of this with COVID, where there's been you know a lot of work to to provide education and engagement that in many ways has been long overdue and has been driven by the pandemic and the need to, um, you know, to respond to what's happening. Um, but it's also highlighting all these gaps that we have had for decades and decades. And, you know, I think that racism being an underpinning component of a lot of this, where, you know, where developments happen, where grocery stores are placed, where, um, clinics are, or how long it takes you to get to um, a certain place. What are the bus lines that go through there? What are the schools that are um, supported? You know, what, what are all these elements that really um, provide um, support? And I think PrEP is a microcosm of this as well. Right. That, you know, these new interventions, and we've known this for as long as we've been looking at this, is that, you know, those who have the highest social capital are most likely to benefit from new advances. And, you know, PrEP is um, not that new, but it's 10 years in since it was approved by the Fight Food and Drug 
um, administration in 2012. Um, and those who had access to it were those who had the resources um, and had access to providers and the ability to change providers if yeah. the provider that they had didn't support that or talk to them about it. And it was normalized that that was an expectation. And that's a privilege that not a lot of communities of color have. Doc, I'd be remiss not to ask about Black trans women in this conversation. Their struggles are well chronicled, but still so tragically overlooked. It's a challenge for Black trans women in this country to stay alive. Where are our Black trans sisters in this conversation? How are they impacted by HIV AIDS in the Black community? What, what does the data tell you about the struggle there? That the struggle is 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 more that the struggle is harder that you know that there are um, there be there are more and more data and better better data being collected at a national level and then at a local level as well here um, you know where in some of the prevalence studies half of uh, black trans women are living with HIV. Um, and that um, access to care and trans affirming care and the ability to not be misgendered and disrespected in clinical spaces is, um, you know, is not something that um, that can be expected for for trans women. And so I think that um, trans women, particularly black trans women, um, should be central like that. If, if we can make the system work and the system supportive for black trans women, you know, this idea that every ship will rise, I think is also true. Um, and so, uh, black trans women have, um, have carried this, you know, extraordinary, extraordinary burden in HIV in life in violence, yeah. um, in, um, isolation and also resilient and yeah. resiliency in responding and, and living and thriving as a trans woman um, who is black or black trans woman or a Latinx uh, trans woman. Um, and that, you know, those are also important pieces to never lose um, is uh, that resiliency. And, there, you know, there's a transgender cultural district in San Francisco yeah. um, that was started by uh, black trans women. And, um, you know, those <laughs> are also important stories um, to tell. And uh, we can never lose sight of the experience of our trans sisters in, um, in response to um, HIV, specifically health in general and equity mm -hmm. um, for all of us. You had mentioned the COVID pandemic and changing just the nature of outreach and communication, the urgency uh, to reach out to all communities, I mean, to, to everyone, but especially very on early, early on in the pandemic, we saw that uh, communities of color, especially uh, Latino and black communities were getting hit disproportionately hard with COVID. And that really uh, hasn't changed. I mean, we're two plus years into, into this thing. Has that created avenues to, to have more conversations with people about healthcare in general? I, I think it's created new opportunities for connections and for engagement and for partnerships that were more equitable than they may have been in the past, um, where there was, um, <clears throat> you know, outreach into communities. There was, you know, building of um, strategies and approaches that were really community involved from the beginning. Um, it was more... Um, lateral was less top down um it at the local level in particular um and i think that that is going to pay um pay off in the in the future i'm hopeful that that's the case and i think it will require the same level of engagement because the community will expect it and i think rightfully demand it absolutely that um you know that 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 engagement to continue in the same way and that it you know that it be community driven and that it be community supportive um, in all the ways that it has needed to be for COVID and that there's accountability um, yeah. for, for all of that. And, and I do think that, and this is a, this is a small, but I think an important piece is that when we talk about uh, communities, we um, have to be mindful and careful not to, to, 
to approach it as a monolith. And I think even talking about people of color is very different when you're talking about, you know, black communities that may have uh, migrated from the South into the East Bay of San Francisco during the war effort compared with um, and lumping them together with uh, recent immigrant communities from Central America or South America. Um, those are communities of color. Those are uh, people of color, but their lived history and perspectives and experiences and interactions and interfacing with um, with the challenges in America are very different. And I think during COVID, we were very mindful and very specific and very thoughtful. Mm -hmm. I think that that needs to continue because the way that you engage the communities is going to need to vary based on what that lived experience is. Um, and that approaching it with a blunt instrument is not going to get us to where we need to be. Yeah. Very important conversation. Very important information. Dr. Hyman Scott, San Francisco Department of Public Health and assistant professor at UCSF. Thank you so much for the info and so much uh, for the time. And thank you for the work you're doing as well. Thank you. It was wonderful talking with you. Thank you again to Dr. Scott. And thank you for listening. New episodes of Bay Current are out every day, and we'd love to be part of your daily routine. You can subscribe on the Odyssey app, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Overcast, wherever you listen. We're also on YouTube on the KCBS Radio YouTube page. That's it for today's Bay Current. I'm Matt Pittman, and we'll chat with you again tomorrow.